Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to church today and uh, for those folks that are here and those following us by way of uh, Facebook or YouTube or the website, I, I welcome you here to Trinity Baptist Church on Sunday morning. We continue in our series. Uh, we're just about done, actually, on the book of Second Corinthians. And um, I appreciate so much Stuart uh, filling in for me last week as I took my uh, fifth Sunday of the month break. As you know, fifth Sunday of the month this year was on Easter, Easter Sunday. So, of course, I... I should be here for that. And so I took the next Sunday off, April 6th. And uh, Stuart did a... Uh, uh, I, I think Stuart needs to take my place. Uh, he is such an incredible preacher. And uh, I learned so much watching his video. And um, he is a, a man of God that is uh, truly a blessing to us as a church family, him and his wife and child. And uh, so thank you, Stuart, for doing that. We continue in our series here. Uh, we're now looking at 2 Corinthians 13. And um, what I'd like to do here is we're talking about Paul is coming with authority to the Corinth church. But what I want to do is just review a little bit of uh, chapter 12 that we had talked about earlier, okay? Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 10, Paul continues his defense against the acquisi acquisi accusations of false apostles who sought to undermine his authority and and what Paul does in verses 1 to 10 of 2 Corinthians, it's not in your notes, by the way, folks. Uh, this is just a preamble. Is that uh, he recounts an extraordinary experience he had where he had, was caught up in the third heaven and heard in inexpressible words. And however, to keep him from becoming uh, conceited because of these revelations, he was given a, a what's called a thorn in the flesh uh, basically a messenger of Satan to for torment him. And three times uh, Paul pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but the Lord's response was, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And we saw that in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Therefore Paul boasts all the more gladly about his weaknesses, knowing that Christ's power rested on him. Then in verses 11 to 13 of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul shifted his, to, to defend his apostolic authority, urging the Corinthians to um, bear with him despite his weakness. He expresses his fear that when he comes to them again, he may find them not as he wishes and that they may find him not as they wish. And he fears he may have to discipline them for their sins and this causes him great distress because he's theoretically like their pastor and no pastor really likes to discipline his members or or have those difficult conversations then we saw in verses 14 to 21 of second corinthians chapter 12 that uh, we see here that paul concludes the chapter by expressing his love for the corinthians stating that he will gladly spend and be spent for their souls, even though they seem not to appreciate him. And he reassures them that he does not seek what is theirs, but uh, he seeks for them goodness and their faith. And he expresses his concern that when he comes to them again, he may find them not as he wishes, and that they may find him not as they wish. And thus he fears he may have to discipline them again for their sins. So in summary, 2 Corinthians 12 is a chapter where Paul recounts his extraordinary experiences, defends his apostolic authority, expresses his concern for the Corinthians, and reaffirms his love and commitment to them despite their shortcomings. So now that brings us to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And um, in this particular passage, before we get into the text, um, Paul warns them that he may have to come a third time to visit them. 
And he plans to visit Corinth uh, for the third time. And he, we'll see that in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 13. And he warns of accountability and judgment when he arrives, verses 2 to 4. And then he encourages them to examine themselves. Uh, he says that in verse 5, where he uh, encourages them to examine themselves, and he exhorts them to test whether they are in the faith. We're going to talk about this today, if they're really in the faith or not, in verse 5. And then Paul's prayer for the Corinthians uh, is in verses 6 to 9, and then Paul's hope that they will not do evil, leading to their edification is found in verse 10. And then finally, in 2 Corinthians 13, towards the end of the chapter, uh, Paul has his final greetings and benediction and uh, where he talks about all these various things, uh, exhorting to be of one mind, to live in peace, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so today, I want us to examine the first part of 2 Corinthians 13, where we see Paul issuing a powerful call uh, to self-examination. Uh, in the verses we will be looking at, Paul implores the Corinthians to self-examine their lives. In other words, to test themselves, to examine whether they are truly walking in the faith that they have. And as we explore this passage together, let us also reflect on the significance of having what I call an authentic faith, an authentic faith in our lives and in the importance of continual self-assessment in our spiritual journey that Paul is imploring the church in Corinth to do as well. So let's take a look at the text. I'll give you the outline, and then we'll open in prayer, and then we will get right into the text. Let's pray. Let's take a look at it. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 6 in the New King James Version of the Bible says, This will be the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I have told you before, and I foretell as, I, as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, not, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So my outline is very simple. We're going to look at the authority of Paul's witness. We're going to see that in verses 1 to 4. And then we're going to look at this thing called self-examining ourselves. It's called introspection. And I'll explain that to you what that is. We see that in verses 5 and 6. So with that, I want to open in prayer, and then we will look at the authority of Paul's witness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do count it a privilege to open the Word of God here this morning. Father, it's a text of Scripture that I, that I personally have enjoyed studying and looking at, because it really is kind of a cool passage for us personally as individuals who claim to be born again evangelical followers of Jesus. And so, Father, I do thank you for Paul's invocation here, his explanation of why he is coming to the church in Corinth. And Father, may we be able to apply it to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So first of all, we see the authority of Paul's witness. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. Paul, in this passage of Scripture, invokes his authority as an apostle, and he reminds the Corinthians of his previous visits and warns of further action if necessary. And, and we see in the text that Paul begins by invoking the authority of witness. 
You see, he reminds the Corinthians that he has already visited them twice, and he will not hesitate to exercise authority again if necessary. And thus, this underscores the seriousness of the matter at hand. In my personal opinion, as believers, we are not to take lightly the admonitions and instructions given by those appointed by the Lord to guide us. In other words, we need to re- have a utmost respect to those who communicate the Word of God. Because not only is it important that we grow in our walk, but that we understand that that individual is going through the same things that we are, and they are processing this, and they were bringing it forward to us, and thus we need to be, take seriously what we're hearing that is being uh, proclaimed. And just as Paul held authority over the Corinthian church, as much as people hate to hear it, but that we too are under the authority of God's word. And also to those who faithfully will claim it and the local church. We can't dismiss that fact that we need to take our lives as Christians a lot more seriously than we do at times. And thus, that brings us to our second point, and that's the call of self-examination. In verses 5 and 6, Paul urges the Corinthians to examine themselves. Uh, The call to self-assessment in the faith. It becomes the test of authentic faith. When was the last time you spent time examining yourself? Not worrying about anybody else, but your own personal walk with God. Because after all, the test of authentic faith is that knowing that Christ is in us and the challenge to verify their faith through what I call introspection. Introspection is the examination or observation of one's own mental and emotional processes. Introspection is a psychological process that involves looking inward to examine one's own thoughts, one's own emotions, one's own judgments and perceptions. In other words, we need to be self-examining ourselves and not looking at others but looking at our own personal walk with him it says in the text examine yourself sorry that didn't work but um i think you know what i'm I'm saying is examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith it says test How do you test? We're going to talk about that in a minute. So many people, in my opinion, spend too much time examining others, having an incredible opinion about others, while their own life is a disaster. We need to encourage, we need to be encouraged to live according to, to the truth of the gospel. You see, the message is a direct challenge. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, it says in verse 5. And this is a call to introspection, a call to assess the genuineness of one's faith. It is not merely about outward appearances or religious activities, but about the condition of our hearts. We need to ask ourselves, are we truly living in accordance with the teachings of Christ? Are we bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that we find in Galatians? You see, these questions demand honest reflection and a willingness to confront areas in our life of things like hypocrisy or spiritual complacency in our lives. In other words, we need to have that test of authentic faith. And Paul sets forth the standard by which we are to examine ourselves. He says, do you not know yourselves? 
Interesting. Do you not know that Jesus Christ lives within you? This is the essence of authentic faith, Christ dwelling within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I truly trust that our faith is not merely a test, a set of beliefs or rituals, but a living, dynamic relationship with the living God. And I suggest to you that if Christ is truly in us, then our lives will reflect his character and his love. Some text of scripture that helps us with this, to understand that, is Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, this passage reinforces the idea that true faith is demonstrated through obedience to the Lord's will, not merely through outward actions or religious performances. James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You see, in that text, James echoes the call to action and self-examination, emphasizing the importance of living out the truth of God's word to our community and to our families. Galatians chapter 6, 4 and 5 says, But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. This verse underscores the personal responsibility we have as believers in Jesus Christ and that we are to examine our own life and deeds rather than comparing themselves to others. So many times in church life, I, I hear people saying, well, I don't do that and I don't do this. and That's wrong. You examine your own life. Don't worry about somebody else's life because you think you're better than they are. You're not. You know, I, I remember a long time ago, um, you know the old story, if you're pointing your finger at somebody, there's all these fingers pointing back at you. And I said, well, what about the thumb? And then they say, that's enough. First <laughs> uh, John 4, 13 to 16 says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And when we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. You see, John emphasizes the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as evidenced of our relationship with the Lord and encourages believers to abide in his love. So in conclusion of this text, I suggest to you that we see in the text, we see in the passage before us today, that First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 6, serves as a call to introspection and examination of one's faith, emphasizing the importance of authenticity and genuine relationship with Christ. Recently, I had to go to a family funeral. And meeting so many people that used to go to church but don't go anymore, and I'm a nosy parker. So I asked, how come you're not going to church anymore? And I would say 
The majority of the time, it's because of something that happened in church life. Not to them personally, but that the hurts that they endured because of others, behaviors of others that were reflected upon these family members. How they were looked upon as being lesser than others because of social status, because of family lineage. You name it. Some were hurt just by the actions of others towards them. But you want to know something? I really truly believe in my heart that they would still be in church life today if they had done some self-examination, some introspection of their own lives, and realized that they're not perfect. That they're as much a narcissist as that person is a narcissist. (laughs) But they can't see that because they are blind to the truth and they are not walking with God today. You see, this passage of Scripture that we're looking at today challenges us not to shrink back from the challenge of self-examination and let us earnestly seek to know ourselves and to know Christ more deeply for it is only by abiding in Him that we can truly bear fruit and bring glory to His name. So let's not worry about others. Let's worry about our walk with God. You see, the bottom line of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 to 6, is Paul calling out the Corinthian church to self-examine, to be accountable to the Lord. And Paul warns them that his imminent third visit reminded them that they will not spare those who continue to sin. And he urges them to test themselves, ensuring that they are walking in the faith and living according to the teachings of Christ. And the passage that we have looked at here today emphasizes that importance as I keep beating upon you of introspection and repentance leading to spiritual growth and righteousness. And thus, like the Corinthian church, we too are called out to look at our own personal lives. Who cares about your neighbor Who cares about your spouse? Oh, but I have to worry about my spouse. Yes, but right now I'm asking you to do something, and that's just to look at your own life as it reflects Christ. Because we are called to look at our own lives, and we need to ask the question, are we walking in the faith and living according to the teachings of Christ. What are the teachings of Christ? The Bible that you have before you, or you have on your iPad, or you have in your phone. There's things in there that says, you want to have blessing in your life? Then do this. You want to have cursing in your life? Then just keep doing that. (laughs) Our next series that we're going to be doing here at the church is the book of Proverbs. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Talk about practical. And we're going to learn a lot of stuff in there that we, we, we will understand where this walking in the faith and living out according to the teachings of Christ, we will have positivity and not negativity. Here's one. And I did this recently. I was on a trip and I drove my car over to the ocean. I was on the west coast. And I watched the waves crashing on the shore. And I just sat there and I said, you know what? Lord, me and you are going to have a talk. Yeah, I'm out here visiting a client and I'm doing my thing, but I want to talk. You and I are going to talk. And I got quiet before the Lord and I looked at my own life and I wrote all sorts of stuff down in my journal. In my, uh, I have a, a computerized journal thing called Day One. And I looked at my habits that I have that drive people in my life crazy. 
Does that have bad habits? Then I said, are these becoming of a person who claims to be a born-again follower of Jesus? And I realized there's a few places that I need to work on. Because if you're not working on your life and growing spiritually, then you become stagnant. And I go back to this funeral that I went to. Many of the people that have walked away from God had a stagnant faith. It wasn't a vibrant faith. It was a faith based on family culture. It was a faith based on um, looking at others, but not looking at their own lives. Thus, are you spiritually growing in your walk or you're stagnant? When was the last time you spent some time in quiet reflection? Just you and the Lord. Um, when was the last time that you just... Um, it was funny because on this particular day, I, um, I have... Uh, Cirrus satellite on my phone, and I, I can patch it into the whatever rental car I got. And, and uh, I have this one called, uh, I also have another one called Stingray, and Stingray at CBC. And Stingray has a really good section in there of religious music. And, and I found a section that was just nothing but old hymns of the faith. And some of them were no singing, they were just piano or instruments of some sort. And I tell you, I, 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 f I felt in my heart a moving of God. I can't explain it, but I'm not going to say that, uh, I'm not going to go extreme on that. I'm just going to say, and it was, I found myself calmer. I found myself not taking everything seriously well only the things seriously that i needed to but i i came to realize that everything works out to his glory no matter what's going on in my life or anything that's going on god will fix it and i don't need to stew on it just like if i have people in my life who uh are just uh just it's just a lot and you're constantly trying to pull them in or reel them in or whatever let them do what they got to do. And because after all, at the end of the day, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect my family. So if they want to live like that and they want to act like that, that's on them. And I came to that place of realizing that I need to have a better relationship with my home life and a better relationship with my pastoral life and a better relationship with my church life. And that I don't, get all percolating about others around me and what they're not doing or what they are doing, but that I do what God has called me to do. And so, may I suggest to you, like the Corinthian church, we too are called out to look at our own lives. Are we walking in the faith and living according to the teachings of Christ? When was the last time you got quiet before the Lord and looked at your own life and turned from old bad habits that are not becoming of a person who claims to be a born-again follower of Jesus. Are you growing in your walk, or are you stagnant? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this passage of Scripture that uh, you put before us today. And I want to thank you, Father, for the opportunity I have of being able to share that uh, with this church family and for those that are following us by way of video. Lord, may we be growing in our walk with you and not just staying in one spot. May our lives reflect such wonderful things. And may we just have a closer walk with you, Lord. And I thank you for today. I ask this in Jesus' name.